political uncertainty looms in Malaysia after UMNO withdraws its support for Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. With thousands bringing forward their appointments, is Singapore on track to achieve its vaccination targets? And HDB resale prices keep on rising with 19 flats changing hands for at least a million dollars last month. Hello, I'm Olivia Quay. You're watching The Big Story live in the Straits Times newsroom. You can subscribe to our channel so you never miss a single episode. Let's start across the causeway where Malaysia reported close to 9,000 new COVID-19 cases today. So as the country battles the pandemic, there's no resolution yet to its political crisis as well, with UMNO withdrawing support for Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. Party President Ahmad Zahid Hamidi said Mr. Muhyiddin has failed to fulfil its conditions when it backed him to become PM in March last year, namely to spearhead economic recovery and effectively handle the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, here with the latest is The Straits Times' Malaysia Bureau Chief, Shannon Teo. Welcome back to the show, Shannon. So yes, UMNO has withdrawn its support of Mr. Muhyiddin and it is the biggest party in the Perikatan National Administration. But are the odds in Mr. Muhyiddin's favour still in terms of how many MPs are still backing him? But this is exactly the problem we have now in that because UMNO is split, we don't actually know how many MPs still support Muhyiddin. Um, the Attorney General has spelled it out himself saying that while a component party in government has declared its intentions to pull out, it is up to the MPs themselves to determine who has majority. And hence, um, and I quote him, there is no clear facts pointing to a loss of majority. Now, this morning, uh, senior Perikata National leaders, including AMNO's newly minted uh, Deputy, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob, mm -hmm. Uh, they were locked in discussions with the Prime Minister at his residence. Uh, and presumably, this is on how to deal with the AMNO Supreme Council decision. Now, it's important to note that not every AMNO MP is in the Supreme Council, which is uh, the top uh, decision-making body in the party. In fact, only 15 out of AMNO's 38 MPs are in the Supreme Council. And of those 15, some like Ismail Sabri, well, they're clearly of the opinion that they should stay in government. So how many MPs does... Uh, the president Zahid really have in his camp. Uh, this is not, uh, there's, there's no clear answer. People are estimating. And over the past year, all sorts of analysts and all sorts of reporters have tried to figure out what is this number. And it always ranges somewhere between half a dozen to uh, 15, so, you know, it's somewhere around those range. But uh, nonetheless, on paper, what we know is this. We didn't have had 113 out of 220 in the lower house prior to Wednesday. Now, it, I think it's fairly certain that Zahid's camp has more than three MPs. And so this means that the Prime Minister would be just shy of the 50% mark, which he needs uh, if he's going to win any uh, uh, vote in Parliament. So he has to eventually, Muhyiddin has to eventually show where he's going to get this extra support from. Um, how this is going to happen, well, it, it could be done in Parliament. It, it could be out of, from a declaration. Some MPs could say that they now support supported Muhyiddin. We don't know yet. I mean, we don't know what the plans are. It's still in pretty early stages of what is pretty much a full-blown political crisis. Right. Well, Amno, uh, they want Mr. Muhyiddin to step down and an interim prime minister put in place ahead of the election. Shannon, who could hold the post? Now, Amno, they've also not named any candidate. They've, they've pointed out what they want, but they've not pointed who they want. So um, obviously, one of the things they've mentioned in their statement is that they won't back opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim. Now, Anwar has the largest bloc, Pakatan Harapan has 88 MPs. But if Anwar doesn't back uh, Anwar, then it's likely not going to be Anwar. Um, some other names being bandied about include those from uh, the Zahid's opposing camp itself. You know, They're talking about Ismail Sabri himself, uh, Foreign Minister Hishamuddin Hussein, who has also been uh, recently promoted to, to senior minister. There are some compromised candidates we can think about, like uh, Tunku Razali. He is Amno's longest serving MP. Um, this is still kind of like a, a dark horse uh, option. Um, and also one of the biggest proponents of something called a, a National Operations Council, the, the, the NOC was a body that was in charge 
during the last emergency in 1969. Now, the biggest proponent of it is uh, the former Premier Mahathir Mohamad himself. So it's kind of a tilt for him to take charge of things uh, for the third time in his career. He is due to hold a press conference at about 5.30. Uh, We're still waiting to see what comes out of that. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we'll, we also have to see whether he's still uh, proposing that or maybe he's changed his mind about who he supports for Prime Minister. He's got a, a set of MPs behind him as well. Now, um, you know, it, it could just be that uh, an interim Prime Minister moving forward doesn't even need a majority, you know. Uh, it could just be on a on a case-by-case -case basis. It could just be that uh, this leader is going to lead for six months, one year, just get us out of the pandemic, and then we go straight for an election. So it, it is very uncharted waters. Um, and at some point, uh, one presumes that the king himself is going to have to get him off. Right. Well, so it's at least, uh, you know, three more weeks of uncertainty over in Malaysia with the with the next parliament session scheduled for July 26th. But what do these developments mean for that sitting? Well, no one so far is talking about changing the dates. So we still have July 26th, the MPs are supposed to come back. Now, nonetheless, uh, there will be more pressure. It will be ramped up for some kind of test of the prime minister's uh, majority. He's, he, you can't preside over the house if nobody knows whether you actually command the confidence in the house. Now, whether there's going to be an actual confidence vote or, or something else, um, I mean, it's, it's, it, this is a political process. The politicians themselves are going to have to figure out how they're going to determine this. Um, so, I'm not, I mean, as you say, it's going to be at least another three weeks of political uncertainty for Malaysia, but I'm not betting that it ends at three weeks. There's probably going to be a lot more drama even after the, 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 the parliamentary session. So hang on to your seats. Well, thanks so much for the update, Shannon. That was Shannon Teo, our Malaysia Bureau Chief. Keep abreast of the developments at straitstimes.com. COVID-19 death toll globally has hit 4 million. While rapid vaccine rollouts have allowed normal life to resume in countries like Britain and the US, developing nations with limited vaccine access are shouldering a rising death count. Global deaths jumping from 3 million to 4 million in just 82 days. India accounted for 26% of this increase, Brazil about 18%. The US accounted for 4%, but as you can see, it still has the highest number of COVID-19 deaths in the world. Back home, 11 straight days of single-digit locally transmitted cases with three confirmed today. Two were unlinked and one is currently linked. It's not yet confirmed if any of the local cases was in the dormitories. Today's 13 other cases were imported. All except one were detected upon arrival. The remaining case developed COVID-19 during SHN or isolation. As we look forward to eating out in bigger groups from Monday, vaccination remains key in our further reopening. Health Minister Ong Yee Kang saying yesterday that before Singapore can relax more restrictions, the target is to achieve 50% full coverage by the fourth week of this month. And this can be reached based on the current vaccination rate with 3.7 million first doses administered as at yesterday. On average, Singapore is now vaccinating 76,000 people a day and about 131,000 people have brought forward their second vaccinations appointments. While the World Health Organization, though, has urged extreme caution for countries considering lifting COVID-19 restrictions, they warned that high vaccination rates wouldn't stop rising transmission. With that in mind, let's bring in Associate Professor Alex Cook, Vice Dean of Research at NUS's Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health. Good to have you back on the show, Prof. So, at least 50% of the population fully vaccinated by the end of the month, 65% by National Day, and eventually 80% vaccinated. But what's the risk assessment of each milestone that cases will rise like we've seen in other countries when they relax their restrictions? I think there's, there's two main aspects that we can be considering when we look at these milestones. The first is the effect on reducing spread. The second is the effect of reducing severe outcomes such as death. Based on the projections of, of vaccine uptake in different age groups and the different risk in the different age groups. We think that the mortality risk has already fallen by about 80% since the start of the year. 
the risk of spread given a contact is probably reduced by less, by about 30%. Now, as we hit these milestones that the government has indicated, um, we think that the effect on transmission will be to fall from a 30% reduction to 40%, 50%, and 55% for those three milestones. The risk of death will probably fall further. We can probably cut the overall risk of death by an extra half if we're able to push up vaccination to around about 90% of the oldest age groups. But, but what is really critical is not just the percentage who are vaccinated, but who is it that gets vaccinated? If the vaccine uptake doesn't improve further in the older age groups and we're stuck at that current level of mortality, then that means that many deaths will still happen as we move into the endemic state. Um, and these deaths will primarily be amongst older individuals who are not vaccinated. The milestone I think that we probably need to put more emphasis on is the last of the three milestones, because that's when most of the other measures which are currently in place to prevent spread are thought to be relaxed. Since the Delta variant is so transmissible, even if, if there's a 50% or reduction or more in the risk of transmission given contact um, through vaccination, um, that won't be enough to completely prevent spread in the community. And that's why when we look at some of the other countries which are further ahead in their vaccine rollout than we are like Israel or the UK, once they import the Delta variant, they see a, a substantial um, wave of, of cases of COVID. Right, well, Prof, how much will vaccination numbers matter under the new normal when key considerations will then be on hospitalised cases? Yeah, well, exactly. If enough of the older individuals are vaccinated, then even if there are cases, more cases than we're used to in the community, the severe infections, the ones which are going to be stretching the healthcare system, the number of those should be manageable. So ideally what we want to see in the next month is for as many unvaccinated younger people to come forward for vaccination, to reduce community spread that will lead on to infection of the elderly. And secondly, as many of the unvaccinated elderly individuals to come forward for vaccination, because that will directly um, link to the reduction in the number of people who need to be hospitalized or who will die of COVID over the next 12 months. Right, well, a rosy picture shall we say it, has been painted for the future, an MC if you're infected with COVID-19, live concerts, going maskless and overseas travel eventually. But at what vaccination milestone can we expect to achieve these outcomes? And what are some of the other considerations? So maybe let's, let's, let's answer that with a rhetorical question. Let's say that we get to that final milestone, 80%, and that's the best that we're able to do. The other 20% cannot get vaccinated because they're too young. Uh, or they don't want to get vaccinated. So we reached that, that milestone, 80%, and there's no one left in the queue waiting to get vaccinated. What advantage would there be at that point from holding off on moving to the rosy picture that you depicted? Um, how, how can we be any better prepared for endemic COVID? The answer is that we couldn't. From an epidemiological perspective, there's not really any benefit to waiting further unless there are people in the queue who want to get vaccinated but have not had the chance to do so yet. So the only caveat I would say to that is that later this year, hopefully, we should have confirmation that vaccination of younger children under age of 12 is safe. And at that point, we might be able to vaccinate another 10% another or so of the population. Pediatric COVID is quite mild, though, so I'm not convinced that waiting to build to vaccinate under 12s is a good reason to delay reopening. So I think that when we get to that last milestone, if there's still people in the queue waiting to get vaccinated, then yeah, sure, we can hold off a little bit further. Um, but if there's no one waiting to get vaccinated, I see no epidemiological benefit to doing so. Well, Professor, as always, thank you so much for your insights. I've been speaking with Associate Professor Alex Cook, Vice Dean of Research at the Sorcery Hawk School of Public Health at NUS. Meanwhile, according to the National Centre for Infectious Diseases, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals' COVID-19 antibody cocktail will likely be used in Singapore once it's available. It can be considered for high-risk patients who have developed symptoms within 10 days. A large British study showed that the drug can reduce the mortality rate by 20% among people hospitalised for COVID-19 and whose immune system had not mounted an antibody response. In non-COVID-19 news, 452 suicides were reported here last year, the highest since 2012. 
According to Suicide Prevention Centre Samaritans of Singapore, the increase was observed across all age groups, but particularly among those 60 years old and above. The organisation said elderly callers expressed difficulty coping with loneliness due to isolation, psychological distress and impaired social and family relationships, which were compounded by the pandemic. From July 26, those who need emotional support can call Samaritans of Singapore at its new four-digit hotline. Here are other helplines. Take a screenshot and share it with anyone who may need help. In other news, HDB resale prices rose for the 12th straight month, advancing 0.9% in June compared with May, and was broad-based, climbing for both mature and non-mature estates as well as across all room types. Last month also saw 19 resale flats change hands for at least $1 million, a jump from 13 such transactions in May. And after a hiatus last year, the Michelin Guide is back and will be dishing out its coveted stars on September the 1st. A new Young Chef Award will also be given out to a chef under 36 years old from a Michelin starred restaurant. The Bib Gourmand list is returning as well and will be released on August the 12th. Let's do a quick check-in with our colleagues at Life. Believe it or not, it's been two years since Avengers Endgame, where we last saw Natasha Romanoff, also known as Black Widow. But she's back in the Marvel Cinematic Universe's latest offering. Film correspondent Don Lui has a review for us. So, John, it's been a long wait for Black Widow to get her first solo film ever since the character debuted in Iron Man 2 11 years ago in 2010. With this being Scarlett Johansson's last time playing Black Widow, so is this film a satisfying send-off for her? Well, it's a send-off, it's a goodbye, but I wish it was a better goodbye. Um, Black Widow is a film with a lot of ideas. And one of the ideas is that you see a bit of where Natasha Romanoff, a.k.a. Black Widow, and Yelena, who's played by Florence Pugh, who's another superhero, where the two of them came from. And they came from a Soviet... Um, training spy assassin training program called the Red Room and it's an, a sinister organization that takes in girls who are tr sold by traffickers they're kidnapped they're stolen and trains them up to be to be killers now this is an evolution of Marvel, right? Like in uh, the TV series or the series on Disney Plus, uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we see Marvel transitioning from villains being space aliens like Thanos or gods to fighting real world issues like you see in um, Falcon and Captain America. You see them grappling with the legacy of slavery and, and racism. So this is Marvel in Black Widow tackling with the the, tackling the issue of trafficking and misogyny and all that. Now, the, the problem is that it's a big topic and in my opinion, they don't handle it very well. It's an uneasy mix of fantasy and reality. I see. Well, John, it might be Black Widow's uh, solo outing, but she's not alone. You already mentioned Florence Pugh, Florence Pugh and uh, Scarlett Johansson is joined by David Harbour as well from Stranger Things. How much did they bring to the movie? Oh, they brought a lot. I mean, Florence Pugh is great as Elena. She's also someone who's brought up. She's a widow, you know, another one of the... Re uh, graduates of the Soviet training program, just like Natasha Romanoff. And if you recall, you, we last saw her in a little movie called Midsummer, in which she played someone who was inducted, just like in the Red Room, into a cult. Similarities there. And David Harbour, as you know from Stranger Things, he's great too. He's a comical figure. He's the Soviet Union's version of Captain America. So he's Red Guardian and he's funny and you wish you saw more of him. 
Well, thanks so much, John. Black Widow opens in cinemas today. It's also available on Disney Plus Premier Access from tomorrow. And if you can wait for it, it will be free for all subscribers from October the 6th. Well, it's a female-centric episode of Life Picks today with assistant life editor Livia Ho talking about the upcoming Festival of Women. So this year, the festival deals with taboo topics like ageing, the female body and circumcision. So Olivia, what um, are you looking forward to the most? Well, this is the third year of the Festival of Women, so it's known as um, now Not Ordinary Work. It's by T-Works. Uh, this year, it's going to be a digital festival for the second year running because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, previously, we've had really exciting stuff come out of this festival, like uh, Three Fat Virgins in 2019. Last year, we had King by Joe Tan, which was one of the best motor dramas that I saw last year. So this year, I think I'm looking forward to Unbecoming. That's, um, that's a drama by Sim Yen Ying and Nabila Said. And it's about mother-daughter relationships. It's, um, it comes in several parts. It's a device performance. And there's also an Instagram account, which is at Unbecoming Stories on Instagram. That's been inviting submissions via an open call. And uh, so it's been collecting stories from members of the public. So ahead of the performance, you can check it out on Instagram. Uh, then some of the stories I think that they go into are um, a millennial mother and her Gen Z daughter and their disintegrating relationship. Uh, doula, a doula, which is a person who helps you with pregnancy and giving birth, and she finds herself trapped in a cycle that she can't seem to break. And uh, so it seems like uh, it's going to really go into the stories of these women across time and space and reality. Right, got it. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Olivia. The Festival of Women starts on July the 13th. Well, the Friday pages in tomorrow's paper will have more weekend picks from my colleagues at Life. Visit straightstimes.com for more news and videos. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Quay. See you tomorrow on The Big Story.